people with nothing better to do. Welcome to Ye old Entertainment. My name is Alex, and it will be my duty, my mission, my purpose in life to help you decide whether that game that you have been thumbing for so long is indeed the right game for you or not. And today we're going to be talking about Grim Dawn, or at least at some point in this video we are going to be talking about Grim Dawn. And I say that because I think that a little bit of Diablo 2 history is in order, and here's why. When I played Diablo 2 for the first time, 20 years ago, I was already an asshole at the time, so I started looking for ways to knock off that perfect 10 out of 10 that I thought this game deserved. But after 5 playthroughs with 5 different characters, getting a taste of all three difficulty levels and even engaging in some multiplayer action which is something that i don't generally do i just couldn't find a reason to take away a single fraction of a point from this fiendishly brilliant masterpiece of a game the gameplay was addictive the mechanics were intuitive yet tactically complex and challenging which is something that i always look forward to in a game of this sort the story was engaging, the loot was brilliantly designed, and the replay value was almost endless. Hell, it would have been endless if other developers hadn't distracted me with their petty half assed new games. Now, since Diablo 2 proved to be such an entertaining experience, I had a flash of brilliance. The kind that keeps the world moving, you know? I thought, man, do you think there are other games out there comparable to this one, at least in some capacity? And I guess that's how I embarked upon the crusade to find good isoparametric RPGs in the Diablo 2 tradition. Unsuspecting, oh ignorant me, that the gaming ocean was indeed a vast one. And also filled with steaming piles of shit. I must have played every available RPG at the time, and... Yes, they had classes. But beyond fairly consistent talent and skills, None of these classes in any of these excuses for RPGs really offered any strategic diversity. See, playing Diablo 2 with the Barbarian, for example, offered a completely different experience than playing it with, say, the Necromancer. And if you held a gun to my head right now, I would probably not be able to spit out more than two or three classes in all those other games that I masochistically put myself through at the time. And that's because regardless of which class I chose in these games, they all seem to end up offering the exact same shit. These games also had loot, as they all do, but the loot was either infuriatingly scarce, I'm looking at you, <coughs> Loki, or abundant to the point of being irrelevant and uninteresting. And even when the drop rates per tier were balanced, the perks and attributes in the items rarely went beyond your typical plus X strength bonus or plus Y percent to your attack speed bonus. See, 20 years later, I still remember the first time I acquired Colwyn's Point. And you'll see the image on your screens right now because I took the time to look for that item. It was a sword, I remember, that was not exactly meant to be used by a necromancer, as swords aren't exactly meant to be used by necromancers. But that sword gave plus one to all skills, and my necromancer heavily relied on skills. And that was the only weapon that I had at the time that gave such a perk. I also remember, and this was 20 years ago, when I got Herald of Sakarum for my paladin. And I remember waiting ages to get that combination of runes that would turn that shield into the perfect item. You see, the moral is that there was tactical value to each and every item, and therefore, they were relevant to your strategic approach to the game, which was your own, of course. See, this is what Chris Wilson, managing director at Grinding Gears Game, had to say about Diablo 2's winning formula. So, back in the mid-2000s, my co-founders and I had played a ton of Diablo 2, like, like thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. And as we, over time, tired of the game, we looked at other action RPGs that we wanted to try out. You know, we tried out Dungeon Siege series and Titan Quest and so on. And we played those games too and enjoyed them, but only for dozens of hours rather than thousands of hours. And so this caused us to ask, why did we sink so much more time into Diablo 2? What was perfect? What made that game the best action RPG that had ever existed? And so we came up with a bunch of design pillars that we feel a perfect action RPG needs that some of the other games hadn't quite hit in all cases. And so those design pillars are as follows. 
The first one is visceral action combat. This goes without saying, it's an action RPG. You need to have immediacy. You hit a monster, it dies, blood goes everywhere, it falls back and you know it's nice and fast and action based. So next we have randomly generated items. Now I kind of wanted to just do an items talk, like just focus on this one for an hour and I, I think I could do a good job of that, but I'm gonna briefly say that if you get your random item system good, it makes your game replayable. And the reason why is because in these kind of games, your items are your progress, right? And the other nice thing about randomly generated items is it's not just a linear progression where the player knows they've got three items left to go and then they're finished. We're dealing with ones where the stats are all over the place, who knows what the next best item is, how, how far it can be pushed. And because of that, you get this cool diminishing returns so that players really appreciate the small upgrades they find because it's a 1% power increase for their character, but it makes them so much better than more of their friends. The final one is deep character customization. This is merely the fact that if you have thousands and thousands of ways of playing your game, then when someone comes back to play at the second, third, fifth, time, they have a different way that they can play it. And in some games where they just have a few simple character classes and it's pretty straightforward, you'll play it with the first class, then you'll play it with the second one, then the third, and eventually you run out of new classes you haven't tried. Path of Exile tries very hard to make sure the class doesn't actually matter that much, it's more about what you're doing with it. Path of Exile is not one of my favorite action RPGs, but it has been one of the most successful RPGs in recent memory. I suspect their understanding of the Diablo 2 formula is largely to be credited for this success. But if we were to ask, what is the secret ingredient for the Diablo 2 formula? You poor pathetic misguided creatures choking down your flaming modes, all the time wondering, how does he do it? Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> the secret ingredient is... Strategy. And maybe you don't think of Diablo 2 as being a strategy game per se, it is not. And that's because the strategy is seamlessly woven into every thread of the fabric of the game. From the classes available, to the talent trees, to the loot, to the mercenaries you hire. Everything is but a tool in your tactical shed that you can put to the service of your favorite strategy. This is merely the fact that if you have thousands and thousands of ways of playing your game, then when someone comes back to play at the second, third, fifth, time, they have a different way that they can play it. And that is the secret, people. Diablo 2 was not great because it had classes, but because each and every class offered the player an absolutely unique way to approach the game. Playing each class required a different strategic approach, it involved the use of different tactics, and they made you pay attention to different aspects of the game. For example, playing the Barbarian turned you into an item-thirsty bastard, all hell-bent on increasing those basic stats and resistances, because that was the Barbarian's deal. While playing a Necromancer, for example, had you obsessing over talent tree progression and items that would grant you extra skill points to bolster your favorite skills. Diablo 2 was not great because it had random items and a ton of loot, but because item drop rates per tier, per item, and per class was perfectly balanced and because there was tactical relevance to your gear, as we already explained. Let's say you were a necromancer and that you were in the business of letting your minions do your dirty work for you while you fiddled around with curses like Attraction, Iron Maiden, Corpse Explosion. Notice how I still remember the names of those skills 20 years later? And you use these skills to make the most out of your damage output. Well, if that was your plan, tactical consistency would dictate that some half-assed blue wand granting you plus two to all summoning skills, for example, or plus two to all skills, and plus one to one other skill that you use, like Iron Maiden, would be far more useful than your unique suicide branch. And I remember this item because I remember it being rare, but being shittier than a lower class blue item. And the reason why it was shittier was because of the strategy that I was going for. And that is the beauty of this game. So, after seven years of playing through half-assed efforts, some of which you're looking at right now, both from reputed and obscure developers, and just as I was ready to throw the towel on the genre and play maybe first-person shooters or something else, in rides developer Ironlore, hand-in-hand -hand with publisher THQ Nordic, to bring us the one game that broke the curse of dullness and mediocrity in the genre. That's right, Titan Quest was released in the year 2007 and its expansion, Immortal Throne, followed shortly after to make a definite statement. And that statement was, We're your new favorite RPG, and we're here to stay. Yes, sir, I said, as I happily immersed myself once again in the tried-and-true formula of monster-slaughtering mayhem.
There were games like Titan Quest that came out where I played through it and said, this is amazing. This is the new game I'm going to play. But see, if Titan Quest had not been anything but a Diablo 2 clone wearing an ancient history skin, it would have never made it to the Hall of Fame of action RPGs. My Hall of Fame. Titan Quest nailed the Diablo 2 formula, yes, but it also packed a neat array of refreshing new features that gave the game a flavor of its own. While Diablo 2, for example, had only one town per act, Titan Quest introduced multiple cities, strongholds, and camps in every act, thus providing the player with a feeling of progression and adventure. You see, setting out to get some help from some garrison located in a remote city felt like the beginning of an exciting adventure, and reaching said city felt like a true accomplishment. Titan Quest was also packed with lots of quality of life improvements to the Diablo 2 formula, like an auto stacking button, an auto organizing inventory button, multiple inventory bags, a much improved map, and the ability to zoom in and out on your character. There were also some other features that most players saw at the time as welcome improvements to the formula. Things like infinite stamina, infinite bow and crossbow ammo, no need to repair or identify items, the amount of potions not depending on your belt capacity, and I think that Riker and I need to have a discussion on whether this is bad design or not. And if you don't know Riker's channel, by the way, you should definitely check it out. So I will leave a link in the description section down below. Although I can't imagine anyone knowing my channel and not Riker's. If that's the case, it's because you're probably a personal friend of mine. And if that's the case, I still recommend that you check his channel out. And all that was fine and dandy. But the one thing that truly swept me off my feet was Titan Quest system of classes and skills and the sheer brilliance of its multi-classing feature. See, many games have offered different forms of multi-classing or skill systems that allow the player to dip into different talents and skills. Skyrim, for example, offers the player a broad array of skills that are not class dependent in any way. The player may pursue all of them if he or she wishes, if he or she wishes to suck at the game also, but none of these talents seem to be particularly designed to work in cross-talent tree synergies. Pathfinder Kingmaker, which came out two years ago, had a classic multi-class system that offered great possibilities, but was anything but intuitive or easy to use. Pillars of Eternity had its own multi-classing system, with secondary classes and archetypes, but it didn't seem to be designed around synergies. Now, know that it does not escape me the fact that some of the games that I have mentioned are classic RPGs rather than action RPGs, but still, I think that we can compare the multi-classing capabilities of Titan Quest with these other games. So to put it simply, Titan Quest just rose head and shoulders above its competitors when it came to classes, skills, and most especially, synergies. Not only were the pictures for every discipline awesome looking and the descriptions badass sounding, but every talent tree I explored out of curiosity, I didn't necessarily play all of them, but all of those that I explored seemed to be cooler and more exciting than the last. While choosing a class in every other RPG, action RPG that is, felt like an exercise of rummaging through genericness to choose the least bad option, in Titan Quest it was quite the contrary. It was more Man, these disciplines are all badass. I want to choose them all. So, let's say you went for the nature discipline. That's the discipline I went for. I played four characters in Titan Quest, three of which had the nature discipline. And I did that because my deal was to walk around with an entire zoo worth of pets following me about. And if you do that, there is a skill in the nature talent tree called regrowth. And the tooltip says, a wave of healing energy rapidly restores lost life to the target ally. And there are various allies at your disposal, should you choose to go with a nature discipline like a pack of wolves or a nymph. But if you also choose spirit as your secondary discipline, you'll get the chance to summon the Lich King, which is an uberly badass one-man army of destruction. But see, for balance's sake, the Lich King is a bit of a glass cannon. He hits like a freaking truck, no doubt but it is also as fragile as the confidence of your average body positivity activist. But, since cross-class synergies are a thing in Titan Quest, and the game is designed around those, 
you can almost completely circumvent your spirit-based Lich King's fragility with your nature-based regrowth. There's also a skill called Dark Covenant, which is a skill within the spirit talent tree, which enhances your energy regeneration and your running speed. But if you also max out the unearthly power synergy, you also get ungodly pluses like additional 50% damage, an additional 34% elemental damage, and an additional 50% fatality damage. And that's for all your allies, both nature and spirit. The thing is that it only lasts 21 seconds and has a cooldown time of 30 seconds. But the refresh talent in the nature discipline, when maxed out, is capable of resetting all your cooldown times, thus turning Dark Covenant into a permanent skill. And if that's not cool synergy design, I don't know what is. See, the multi-classing system in Titan Quest is designed in a way that every discipline has balanced cross-class synergies with every other discipline. It's seamless, it's powerful, and it makes you focus on strategy and tactics rather than on figuring out obscure or unreliable mechanics. But Alex, you deceitful clique-baity scoundrel, I hear you say, wasn't this video supposed to be about Grim Dawn? You've been talking I don't know how many minutes thus far, and you have not even mentioned the damn game. Well, my hypothetical, impatient straw man friend that I use as bridge when I can't think of better transitions, this is a good time for me to remind you that patience is the mother of all virtues. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Titan Quest before getting to the meat. Indeed, in the year 2007, developer Iron Lore and publisher THQ Nordic found ways to add interesting twists, turns, and flavors to the Diablo 2 formula. But nine years later, despite the hardships, the drama, the financial struggle, of which I understand there was a lot, THQ Nordic managed to outdo themselves again in spectacular fashion with an RPG in Diablo 2 tradition, an addictive, entertaining, immersive, and to some extent groundbreaking effort called Grim Dawn. Titan Quest was impressive in many aspects, but the story was not one of them. It was generic, bland and borderline cheesy at times. The dialogues were poorly written and the voice acting could be laughably bad at times. Grim Dawn in turn presents a solid story at the center of which there's an all-consuming threat that's both credible and mysterious and a main character with personal stakes in the whole deal, which is one big difference. The writing is decent, I would say, but not impressive and the voice acting is consistently good throughout the entire game. The setting is a blend of medieval fantasy and steampunk Victorian vibes distilled into a flavor of its own that is both immersive and engaging. And the same goes for the music. I already thought the music in Titan Quest was awesomely epic, and Grim Dawn is at the very least on par with its spiritual predecessor, with a score that feels both epic and oddly yet adequately proggy. And by proggy, I mean that it has vibes that go from Victorian to Old West to everything at the same time. It's just awesome. The sound effects and the sound itself, though it may take a little bit of fiddling around with the options, is some of the best in the business. At one time, I even had to remove my headphones to make sure the raven cawing was not coming from anywhere in the kitchen. That's how good this is. There are no locations per act in Grim Dawn, as there are in Diablo 2 or Titan Quest. Instead, you venture forth into a vast open world map, which takes the feeling of perilous adventure to a new height. Here there are many cities and strongholds, but they are scattered in a vast map. It feels like a very Lord of the Ring-like adventure. It is really, really good. And the good thing is that, although this game does not have randomly generated levels, does have unmapped locations, and I'm not talking about your small cave that you can break into to steal some treasure. There are those, of course, but we're talking about large unmapped zones that are filled with treasure, hordes of enemies, quests, and even secret vendors. The paths to these locations aren't obvious, and they're very easy to miss. Thus, when you explore thoroughly and you find these locations, just the feeling couldn't be sweeter, let me tell you. It's just awesome. This time around, developer Crate Entertainment, which consists, I understand, mostly of people who used to work at Iron Lore, 
dipped into classic RPG waters by injecting the old formula with dialogue options and choice, something as rare in an action RPG as common sense is in a critical race theory enthusiast. But this is not a predominant thing in the game. There's a healthy amount of dialogue-based outcomes that add interesting diversity to the gameplay, but it isn't the gameplay, and that's a very important thing. There's this part of the game in which you run into a little girl, and you can open up a rift and send her through to save her from the monsters. Or you can start questioning her about the oddity of the situation, like, why is she there? How did she survive the monsters? Why hasn't she escaped? If you follow this line of questioning, she'll eventually lose her shit and go full Mephisto on your ass, thus forcing you to show her who's the boss. Admittedly, adding choice to an action RPG is a bit of a wild bet. Crate Entertainment knew this though, so they didn't fool too much around with it, and these mechanics are added in ways that never get in the way of the more important things, like beating the crap out of everything and robbing the place clean of loot. Grim Dawn has many more things to offer, like a wide cast of unique enemy bosses, hero bosses, dynamic weather, the possibility to rotate the camera in an intuitive way, various item enhancements, vendors with special stocks that are only available to those with the right reputation with the factions these vendors belong to, there's achievements, there's level design that's better than most other games in this genre. In short, there's a lot to enjoy about this game. However, this again, these are all cool things, but there are two features in Grim Dawn that totally steal the show for me. First, there's the devotion system. Devotions constitute a new layer of character development and costumization in Grim Dawn. In addition to attributes and skills, the devotion system allows you to further hone your tactics or to patch up the weaknesses that inevitably come along with them. Throughout the world of Cairn, and this is where Grim Dawn takes place, there are desecrated shrines that the player can restore. Some require offerings, others require letting the hell contained within the shrines lose and dealing with the pandemonium that ensues, but restoring these shrines grant you devotion points that you can in turn assign to different constellations of deities for further benefits. Completing a constellation grants you points in one or many devotion types, thus allowing you to unlock other constellations. Using devotion points is a game in itself, and by that I mean planning ahead your constellation career. That is an exercise of tactical planning, as the constellations that are further away from the center offer much better perks than the ones that are near the center. It is easy though to carelessly assign devotion points to whichever constellation seems to be better at the time and neglect the simple math exercise that may help you unlock the path to the truly sweet rewards that await you in the constellations that are farther away. These constellations also offer interesting talents and skills, like the Turtle Constellation, which grants you a force field of sorts, which triggers when your health reaches 40%. This is a skill that you most definitely want to go for if you're a melee character who spends most of his or her time in the fray of battle, but one that you'll want to pass, for example, if you're a summoner, like a necromancer, let's say. And the second feature that steals the show is Grim Dawn's hardcore content. I call it hardcore content, that's not specifically called that in the game. But see, the hardcore content in Grim Dawn is presented in the form of sealed off instances that are difficult to access and that are located in remote parts of the world of Cairn. And these instances you can only open if you have the skeleton key. And most of the times, in order to get these skeleton keys, you must complete long and difficult chains of quests. And it is in this hardcore content where the game goes full Dark Souls on your butt. Not only are these instances insanely tough compared to the rest of the content, there's also the fact that you can't teleport out of them at will to take a break or to sell your stuff. Once you enter these instances, there are only two ways out of them, dying or defeating the big bad guy at the end of the instance. In the event that you die, and that is something that will happen to you, let me tell you, you will find yourself regaining consciousness back at Devil's Crossing, which is sort of like your hometown. If you stubbornly say, no, I'm gonna do this, and you make your way back to the location, and that'll take you some time, you'll see that the instance has been completely closed off for the remainder of your experience which leaves you no option if you're all hell-bent on completing this content, but to log out, then log back in, 
kill everything on the path to the dungeon again, clear the dungeon, get to the instance that is sealed off, and procure yourself a new skeleton key. And the quest giver will give you one key. Ever. Which leaves you no choice but to craft your own skeleton keys, making use of your hard-earned components. The hardcore content is well of the beaten trail, and if you don't pay too much attention to things, you may end up missing it altogether. But its inclusion is a welcome challenge. Some other games like Diablo 3, Path of Exile, and even Wilson offer some form of hardcore content, but it is presented in seasons, riffs, or post-game content. And although that is all fine and dandy and I have no problem with it, I am not too crazy about hardcore challenges that do not tie into the main story anyway. Needless to say, if you're anything like me, you're going to love the form of hardcore content that Grim Dawn has in store for you. So, in conclusion, Grim Dawn is, hands down, the best isoparametric action role-playing game in Diablo 2 tradition to come out since, well, since Diablo 2. But Grim Dawn isn't perfect, and I guess I'd be a little bit disingenuous if I didn't honestly talk about those things that keep this game from being a square 10 out of 10 in my estimation. I think Diablo 2 is a 10 out of 10. Titan Quest and Grim Dawn, they're pretty darn close, but they aren't. See, for all its coolness, I don't think the classes and skills in Grim Dawn are quite as awesome as the ones in Titan Quest. While every class in Titan Quest and the skills and the talents that came along with it felt awesome, fresh, and just out there, the classes in Grim Dawn, while not boring or generic by any stretch of the words, feel nowhere as cool as the ones in its older brother. And I guess the same thing could be said of skills and synergies. Synergies for the most part are cross-class improvement in stats and percentages. And although that is cool and you can see that they planned ahead for these skills to work together cross-class, they don't feel as creatively designed as the ones in Titan Quest. To be fair though, the occultist class is every bit as badass as the best classes in Titan Quest. You should check that one out. And that's the class that they use to promote the game. I think that's the class that you see in the cover of the game. You see it in the art everywhere, and there's a reason for that. But to me, the worst thing about Grim Dawn is the decided lack of closure. Call me old fashioned, but the lack of a proper final cutscene, or at least a sequence of stills, is a downer. That is a downer. And that's the main reason why this game does not get a 10 out of 10. See, while killing the final boss in the core game leads to a pretty cool cutscene that explains what happens after you kill the bad guy, the big bad guy in the end, and also helps introduce the Ashes of Malmuth expansion, said expansion has nothing to say to you after your final epic world-saving encounter with Evil Incarnate. I suppose that the guys and gals at Crate Entertainment thought that a pat on the back and a few words from some random NPCs glorifying your heroic deeds was enough. And it's not, man. I want my cutscene. I want to be acknowledged as the hero who saved the day. I want to rest easy knowing that I saved the world from the ultimate evil and maybe learn of this demon that lies dormant that nobody accounted for that will be the ultimate evil in the next game or something like that. And believe it or not, this put me off of playing Grim Dawn immediately again after finishing the game. Then there's also a couple of nitpicky things that I can think of, which are common to Titan Quest and Grim Dawn. For example, you can't toggle running on and off. This used to be a very useful thing in Diablo 2, especially when playing classes like the Necromancer or the Druid. So it took me a little bit of time getting used to in Titan Quest, and I don't think I really got over it, if I'm perfectly honest. I'm also not a fan of what I can only describe as oversimplification in some aspects of the game. See, in Titan Quest or in Grim Dawn, there's no repairing broken equipment, there's no identifying items, and potions just stack. You can have stacks of 99 potions at any given time, and if you assign them to a hotkey, you can consume them as long as you have potions in your stack. So that makes managing potions not an issue in the game. That's not a thing in the game. And I may be the only one, but I miss the days in which you had to decide between a super rad, tactically appropriate and badass girdle that had only one row of potions available, or the mediocre but sturdy belt 
capable of holding six rows of potions. Most people think belt-dependent potion capacity to be a bad, dated and pointless design practice, but I have to admit I disagree and I miss it. There's also no alternatives to the good old mercenary that you had back in the days in Diablo 2. And for all the things that Diablo 3 did wrong, and believe me we can spend a lot of time talking about those, I do think they nailed the companions feature. Companions feel like a much improved version of the mercenaries, with companions having their own talent trees, their own personal stakes, and even companion quests. And I kind of feel like both Titan Quest and Grim Dawn could have benefited from something similar. In summary, Grim Dawn is not perfect, and it might have missed out on some of the more modern trends in action RPGs. By this I mean that if your fun lies in the ongoing randomly generated challenges and randomly generated locations that you go into to farm items, to make your character stronger in order to be able to take on harder randomly generated dungeons, etc., then this game is not going to be your favorite. But if you seek a single player campaign based game, make no mistake about it, this is hands down your best bet. If your nostalgia for Diablo 2 still shines bright, this is your best bet. There are other good games out there, Torchlight, Path of Exile, Titan Quest, and some others that are also excellent options, but make no mistake about it. Grim Dawn is second to none. And if you still have your doubts, I should probably tell you that there's a Diablo 2 mod out there for Grim Dawn that turns Grim Dawn into Diablo 2, bringing back to modern day life your favorite locations, quests, and classes from Blizzard's Classic. You can also use Grim Dawn classes in Diablo 2. So how cool is that? Well, that's all I got for today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Never stop gaming, but don't let gaming get in the way of your dreams. Bye everyone.